Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Reveal, source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and I ended up doing some arts and crafts during this chapter review. Say hi to Momonosuke. And of course, today we have a review of chapter 1012, which features a whole ton of variety because this is what a lot of people would refer to as like a setup or transitional chapter, or whatever you wanna call it. It's basically Oda looking at all of the pieces that he's meticulously set up on his chessboard, then deciding to just knock half of them off and replace them elsewhere. It's a big old mix up and that is in no way a bad thing because every shakeup leads to a whole new sense of unpredictability going forward. And the best thing about chapters like these to me is that they cram so many characters and fun interactions into a single sitting. So you tend to get a little bit of everything and it's hard not to be satisfied with that. Just as I'm sure it would be very difficult not to be satisfied with consistent injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. So good news, you, yes, you can achieve that very effect by subscribing to the Grand Line Review. This amazing Grand Fleet is almost at 500,000 members and that's like half a million in another way of saying numbers. So let's get there and continue to become the pirate kings of this very specific niche corner of YouTube. But getting into the thing that we're here for, first up we have a segment continuing to fracture and scatter the vassals, which is quite fun because they're all slowly falling into place against what would seem to be their assigned arc opponents. In 1012, Kiku surprises me quite a bit because she essentially claims the right to bring down Conjurer. Probably shouldn't have surprised me too much in retrospect because I imagine that she feels somewhat responsible for allowing that whole Odin shenaniganry to happen. I really like this though, because one of the big complaints that I and actually many, many, many people had in regards to Kiku versus Conjuro was that it happened off screen. And you know, I don't usually care about off screening fights. In fact, in a lot of cases, I think it's the right decision to make for the story, but this was a different matter given that it resulted in a death, a fake death, but still a death. But I think setting Kiku up for another clash with Conjuro is a great way to relitigate this whole conflict. Also, how could I not be hyped to see more of Kiku in combat mode. Kiku of the Falling Snow is probably the most terrifying protagonist that we have on our side at the moment. And I'm very keen to see her cut up Kondra piece by piece, which is what he deserves. But also within this chapter, Kiku had an incredibly important moment with Izo where they talk a bit whilst on the run and Kiku acknowledges how she felt when Izo just up and vanished from Wano. It's strange to think about, but we really haven't had a proper moment between these two siblings. There was that super brief reunion where Kiku got all teary and everything, but the narrative of One Piece just moves so damn quickly that we never really have time to linger and have these conversations, especially not at this point in an arc. So to make things satisfying, Oda has to cram these interactions in wherever possible. And I think he does a great job of that for the most part. Although it does tend to draw my attention to the fact that, oh uh, yeah, we've not really had a proper conversation between these two. And there's another moment of realization like that in this section of the chapter as well, actually. Nekama Mushi found out about Pedro's death, which is something I'd completely forgotten that he did not know. It makes sense, of course. It makes all the sense in the world. Nekama Mushi he hasn't spoken with anyone since so, although I suppose Inorashi may have been able to inform him. But uh, look, we'll forget about that. The interesting thing is though, Pedro's death is just such unbelievably old news to us readers and even watchers that it's a bit of a jolt seeing a character find out about it for the first time. A good jolt that is because this is my favorite vassal setup thus far. I am beyond keen to see a Nekomomushi versus Perispera fight because sure, the candy man may have been able to take down a dog and a carrot, but Sulong Garfield is going to be a very different story. And I think that Perispero is going to collapse before him like a vat of delicious lasagna. Oh, and just for the full zone nostalgia effect, Barriette also makes an appearance, who is the, uh, the teeny tiny monkey who guards the gates of the kingdom. And I like that he gets his own his, like, little reintroduction text as if he is in any way an important character, but you know what, good on him for participating in the raid. I have one very important question though, which is when do we get to see Sulong Barriette? I mean, just think about it. Cute little monkey monster in a top hat. You know, just just tell me you don't want to see that. And then afterwards, wash your mouth out with soap because you are a filthy liar. And fun fact, just because I don't know when this will ever be relevant again, but Bariete is also voiced by Kape Yamaguchi, who you may know better as the voice of Usopp. Which is as good a transition as any into our more Usopp focused part of the chapter, which isn't really Usopp focused at all. He was just kind of there. Look, I'm not gonna lie. I dropped his name just for the smooth transition, which I've now ruined. But we're here now and the star of 1012, in my humble yet loud opinion, is Nami. During this chapter, she all on her own had a triple threat showcase of action, drama, and comedy. Starting out with comedy, of course, and it was pretty hilarious to see Nami attempt to make an ally of Big Mom, then Ulti. So what's the old saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend? Well, as it turns out, 
Nope. This is where Nami shines though, because her comedy is often, I mean, how do I express this? It's like, it's not as clean as most of the other Straw Hats. Like for example, with Luffy, his comedy is entirely due to being an innocent moron. Whereas Nami has this great range of incredibly shallow deception at her disposal. Like just the idea that Nami would blame Ulti for an event that she may not have caused, I find that hilarious. And then to have no shame whatsoever and try to do the reverse with Ulti, I love it. But that was just the disarming setup. And firstly, actually, Ulti. I love Ulti. I praised Ulti in my reaction video to the World Top 100 results, but a line was certainly crossed here. Firstly, as a dog person, impaling Komachio like that is a big no-no, but when she started kicking Komachio when he was down, well, that was it. This is one of those moments where I knew that she was going to be smacked down imminently, like within mere panels, because Oda doesn't tend to go quite that cruel outside of a flashback, unless there's going to be an immediate sense of relief, and dare I say, even justice. Although I definitely expected that justice us to be delivered by Big Mom, so seeing that next page with Nami laying some proper smackdown on Ulti was, mmm, a very welcome surprise. Which of course ticks our Nami action box, but my favorite piece of art in the chapter is the final panel with Nami's look of pure rage and sheer determination in her eyes to make Ulti pay. Not pay pay, we're talking pay. And this of course ticks our Nami drama box. Nami did it all in 1012, or at least she did the big three. But I should also say that Ulti's actions got so much worse by attacking Tama because that was pretty brutal. It's a very small panel, but when you look at it, Tama got like properly swiped with blood gushing and everything. So you know what Ulti, you deserve everything that's coming your way and probably a bit more. Oh, and one big important Ulti thing, I saw this pointed out by Brian Newton on Twitter, but there is a salacious yet accidental mouth reveal in this chapter. When Ulti is rushing towards Big Mom for whatever reason, she does not have her mask on. I mean, it's a clear mistake and it's one of those things that's going to be fixed up with the proper volume release, but I just find it really interesting because I personally did not notice at all. And even though I was literally about to upload what I thought was this finished video, I saw this on Twitter and went, hmm, damn. Other people need to know about this. This whole Ulti has a mouth thing, so and now you know. And uh, back to whatever it is I was talking about. What I'm a bit more interested in at the moment is what the reaction of Big Mom is going to be. I mean, I feel like this won't change anything, but maybe just seeing Nami fight on behalf of Tama will activate something? But I'm not sure, probably not. All I can say is that this Nami moment is not to be understated. She is in the presence of one of the four emperors of the sea who has declared very open hostilities, and instead of doing the reasonable thing of running away, Nami has decided to stay and fight on principle alone. That is a big, big step up for Nami and one that I've won wanted to see for years and years and years now. Wow. I mean, if there was any doubt that Nami deserved her third place finish in the World Top 100 character poll, then surely it's all been obliterated by this singular page. Next up, we move to Sanji and Zoro, which I'm sure the entire internet has made this comparison by now. But Sanji carrying Zoro gives me some serious Wolfwood vibes, which is pretty amazing because if I remember Trigon correctly, his full name is actually Nicholas D. Wolfwood. So we've got some unintentional references happening in both directions here. A mutual referencing, if you will. Anyway, here we're invoking the old manga trope of bandages heal everything, because even though Sanji is not a doctor, it looks like Zoro was going to be just fine. And he's even suggested that Sanji just head on over to the performance floor, which I didn't quite get at first, like it's such a specific and odd suggestion, but narratively it puts Zoro on a collision course with Chopper and or Marco, who might be able to properly heal him. And not only that, but it does bring Sanji back into the mix to potentially face off against either King or Queen, although I do have to say, I'm very much at the point where I really, really really just wants Sanji to have some sort of clear purpose. I've said this before in a chapter review, but he really has the most muddled, crazy pathing of anyone in this entire raid. You know, he started on the performance floor, then he escorted Luffy, then got distracted by Black Maria, managing to set up Robin in the process. Then he decided to head to the roof to help the vassals, then he changed his mind, headed back down to find Momonosuke, and now he's stuck carrying Zoro all the way back to the performance floor, which I need to emphasize is exactly where Sanji started to begin with. I mean, what, he's now done like a full lap of Onigashima, so you know what, Sanji? No more running, no more running until you beat either the obese dinosaur or the gimp dinosaur. I don't care which one it is, you get to choose. But I should say that Sanji is definitely proving my theory about him though, I suppose, which is that he is the ultimate utility straw hat. His character serves as a fantastic vehicle to set up moments for other characters. Even in this chapter, he's quite literally propping up Trafalgar Law in this one panel, who is doing his best to look elegant af despite being heavily, heavily wounded. And you know what, in fact, this panel kind of 
of reminds me of Dress Rosa when Luffy was carrying Laura and Zoro towards Doflamingo, except that Zoro and Laura are very much switched roles here. I also get very strong Whole Cake Island vibes during this section because Zoro and Sanji have a rare moment of understanding, which of course occurs when discussing Luffy. Zoro affirms to Sanji that Luffy is going to beat Kaido, and Sanji is just sort of like, yeah bruh, I knew that already. Which takes me back to Luffy versus Katakuri, where Sanji claimed that Katakuri was going to experience his first defeat with this profound sense of confidence. You love to see it, it's such a simple and common thing, but I enjoy the faith that all of the Straw Hats have in Luffy. Like it didn't even need to be Sanji that we were talking to here, any one of them would have responded in the exact same way. I'm also curious about Mr. Law, though I think this chapter implies that he's going after Big Mom as well. So at the moment he's on the way to collide with that group and maybe Kid actually. And in fact, there's almost an infinite number of ways that this could play out and how these characters could interact. Which is sort of what I mean by Oda knocking the pieces off the board just to place them elsewhere, because this chapter is really just one big refresh on a ton of characters who now have new goals and destinations, several of which we are unaware of, which makes things insanely difficult to predict. And hey, that's exactly how I prefer it to be. I would say that by far the most important part of the chapter is probably the most underrated, and that would be this whole Yamato section. There was some really big seeds being planted here because Yamato has now left Momonosuke and I think is heading upwards to help Luffy. If so, all I can say to that is hell yes. I've wanted Yamato in this fight since the very first moment of revelation. Yamato is a beast, like quite literally, because remember the teeth and everything. And I just, I crave more Yamato action pieces, especially if it happens to be against Kaido. So I'm a big fan of this because for a while there, it looked like Yamato might be going the way of Robin in Dress Rosa, you know, the sort of glorified arc caretaker of arc child. But speaking of child, Momonosuke now has Odin's journal and holy crap, in mere minutes, this childling is probably going to become one of the most knowledgeable people in the world regarding essentially every major mystery that we've been seeking. So I think that Momo will be a very changed boy the next time we see him, that or we'll check in on him mid revelation and he will deliver us some juicy, juicy information. Either way, it's gonna be fun. Also I've noticed this really cute thing that Shinobu's doing, like she's pretending to respect the privacy of this Kozuki legacy, but also blatantly peeking at the jump, which is what I love about the Wano ninjas. Both Shinobu and Raizo are trained to be, in theory, the absolute epitome of stealth, and yet both of them fail so blatantly at the easiest of stealth-based tasks. It's cute, I like it. About as much as I love Yamato's hastily constructed Momonosuke body double, which I kind of want, and good news I suppose, because it would appear to be a very easily homemade object to construct. That Momonosuke looks so easy to make. In fact, I, I wonder, could I? Should I make my own Momonosuke in like the next 10 minutes? Turns out I can, I made this. I, I spent time making this. It took me legit like two minutes. I'm pretty proud of it. I think it looks quite accurate and maybe you should all go and make your own Momo decoys as well. And now this is the part of the video where I tell you to click on another video, which you should absolutely do because we can never have enough One Piece. And while this chapter may be over, we still have plenty to talk about. So I look forward to seeing you there talk about the things that we need to talk about.